Camaro and the Chevelle, you see it too. And the inside wheel, if, if the photo was taken from that side, it looks scary. It looks like the wheel's ready to fall off the car. It's going so negative on the camber. And there were other things done to these cars, but you can see what's happening with the angle of the wheel, particularly the outer wheel, you can see very well. And the differences in cornering are just phenomenal. Well, I first found out about this going back to, I think, 73. Hot Rod Magazine had an article where Hotchkiss Suspension came up with a great idea. They understood this. And what they did was they put the taller spindle from a second-gen Camaro, 70 to 81, onto the 64 to 72 Chevelle, and it converted that with a taller spindle into this. It worked great. Had to use a special lower ball joint, had to use a special length upper A-arm. There were a few bump steer issues, but it, it was a measured 20% improvement on the skid pad, which is a big, big deal. Well, they're not the only ones that know about this. Back in the uh, uh, Penske Donahue days running their, uh, the Trans Am series in the 67, 68 range, they put on a taller Corvette spindle. Yes, it got them bigger disc brakes. But what it also got him is this taller spindle, and it got it running this way instead of this way. And they had a little trouble getting through tech. This was one of the first times tubular AM showed up on competition cars. Till then, they were basically boxed, stamped, reinforced stock arms. But they started doing that, and the tech guys were kind of misdirected, thinking they were saving weight. And they finally got them to approve it, showing that the tubular arms were heavier than the stamped arms. And believe it or not, despite the advertising you're probably going to read, tubular arms are often heavier than stamped arms. That's not really what they're about. Frankly, they're often about as much appearance as anything else. But this taller spindle deal can turn it into that. Now, going back about six years ago, we were selling the same drop spindle for Camaros and Chevelles pretty much everybody else was. It used met geometric brakes from what they call the G-body cars, same thing as the S10. I don't like those brakes. The bore of the caliper is actually smaller than a Mustang II. If you're doing a Mustang II suspension and you put on GM metric calipers, you're going backwards in terms of squeeze, in terms of hydraulic power on the brakes. Because it's a function of pounds per square inch in the line versus square inches of face gives you so many pounds of clamping force. Now you've got a slightly bigger rotor, but going from a 10 and 5 eighths to a 9 and a quarter rotor really isn't as much increase as you think, because it's only the leverage of the radius. It's not the difference in the diameter. So it's half the effect you're probably thinking it is anyway. The real deal is how hard you can squeeze it. So I didn't like that. So if a guy already had a Camaro or Chevelle with disc brakes, first off, he's got to buy more brakes, and there are worse brakes than the brakes he already had. Not a great deal, but it's what was out there. So we came along, and we designed a taller spindle, and it solved several problems. This taller spindle gave us this advantage of this better camber gain that we're looking for with this taller spindle. It also uses the bigger brakes... And I solved the problem of the special ball joint by simply having it machined for the correct taper size instead of swapping on a later Camaro spindle. And I relocated the upper ball joint a little bit so that stock length arms, stock ball joints would fit. It's literally a bolt-on. For a couple hundred bucks on a Saturday morning and the price of an alignment, you can improve your handling 20% and, uh, and maintain your stopping power and lower the car two inches. Pretty good deal. And there are several outfits that are making those now. And they do work out very, very well. I, on this suspension that has this type of control arm, the best first thing you can do to improve those is the taller spindle. It really fixes the problem. Yes, you can mask it. You can come back here and say, well, the problem is really the body roll. So we can put some great big gonzo sway bars on here and some great big gonzo springs and heavy-duty shocks, and it will handle good because the body doesn't roll. The other thing it won't do is, is, is handle very well and ride very well because you basically convert it into a V8 go-kart. And when the tires are skipping across the pavement, instead of complying with the pavement, you lose handling. You certainly lose ride. That's, everybody knows that. There's a couple schools of handling. Uh, a guy named Herb Adams was always a proponent of the softest spring that will hold up the car. If the car is sitting at the right ride height with the key out shut off in your garage, the springs are right. You use shocks, which are in English called dampers. It's really a more descriptive term. They damp the motion of the suspension. You want to improve your suspension, the money spent on shocks is your best dollar spent because you're controlling that motion. And what you're paying for between a, a $30 gas shock and a $100 shock is you're getting more sophisticated valving. And it's the best bang for your buck. You can improve any finished car with a Saturday morning and $400 of bolt-on shocks, and you will not believe the difference. It'll actually improve your ride and vastly improve your handling, particularly with the muscle cars. Because you've got to remember these muscle cars... 
you know, uh, going back to the 64 Chevelle. Well, to come out in 64, they probably, you know, you guys are from Detroit, you know, you guys know the cycles manufacturing these cars. They probably started designing the car in 61. Talking about the Mustangs, they're based on a 60 Falcon. They probably started doing design work in 58. So what were the roads like in 58? What was the traffic density? How wide were the tires? You had three and a half inches of nylon-based uh, bias ply tires. And now we put nine-inch wide radial sticky tires and wonder why they don't work so well. We're asking these chassis to do things they were never designed to do. And yes, they do have geometry shortcomings, but at the time they designed the car, it didn't matter. It was just fine. Just like my Falcon, going back to that, with a six-cylinder motor and skinny, six, probably 630, 670, 13 tires, bump steer was an issue. Well, we went out to those great big wide seven inches worth of rubber on those road hugger bias belted tires we all ran back then. You know, 8,000 miles later, I got bald tires. Bump steer matters. Skinny tires mask a lot, but skinny tires also cost you traction. And you can't turn and you can't stop if you don't have traction. You need sticky tires in the back, you need something that sticks to the ground in the front. Because you got a contact patch about the size of your hand. The part of the pavement that doesn't get wet when you spray the silicone on, that's your contact patch. And anything that diminishes that is taking you that much closer to having a problem. Very quick, another story. Tommy Johnson, the NASCAR guy, the way I met him was we were pulling a car into a swap meet that we'd just done in bare metal. Well, if you've ever had a bare metal car in a trailer, you know it's going to rain before you get it inside. It's like an automatic deal, right? So we're trying to push it inside real quick, and this nice old guy comes helping us. We're turning it full lock and backing it in, and we're tracking a little water and mud into this little swap meet area in Charlotte. And he says, these must handle pretty good. And I said, well, you know, how do you know? And he says, well, NASCAR, he said, we used to paint the tires with the brake fluid or transmission fluid, something that wouldn't evaporate. And we'd rolled around in the garage till we weren't getting blurred treads. Because we knew if we were blurring the tread, we were skidding the tire. We were overheating the tire, wearing the tire, and losing traction. And I love that because these guys had like eighth grade educations and went to work in the mills, but they had the common sense to go past all the technology and said, where the rubber hits the road, I gotta have traction. And if my suspension lays down a nice clear tread, it's doing its job. Doesn't matter who you bought it from, doesn't matter how it, who, who uh, painted it, how pretty it is, it's all about putting the tire down on the road. So always remember that, that's very, very important. And anything you do that diminishes that is gonna get you that much closer to trouble. That's how I learned about bump steer, that's how I learned about reverse Ackerman, all these kind of things. Now, that's a lot I've thrown at you in just a few minutes. Everybody, a lot of nodding heads and you're going, okay, good, this is going along good. But don't let me bore you. You guys got to ask some questions, so we'll have some fun with this. So let's go on to this. I beat that to death. Okay. Uh, tall spindle, we talked about that. Ackerman, this comes up all the time. And this has kind of uh, reared its head again with a lot of the uh, unfortunately named rat rods, because there's some pretty nice cars that are being named rat rods. I've got a 34 fenderless car that's in flat paint, and people would call it a rat rod. I don't. I think it's a matter of being built right, but when you turn that axle around, I see some young guys here, you may be into this deal. We used to do a thing called a suicide perch, and then you could lower the car without a dropped axle, or even with a dropped axle sometimes, you'd turn your spindles around so that you'd have your tie rod in the front. Well, that's great, but it creates a problem. And I'll tell you what that is. This is a principle called Ackerman. And the history of this is, <clears throat> Ackerman was actually an Austrian carriage builder back in the 1700s. And just like today, on Sunday when the sun's shining, the young guys are in the park showing off for each other and showing how fast their equipment will go. Well, just like we do with our Hondas and everything today, they were doing this with carriages back then and they started making these things lighter. That's where the term spider comes from. It was a very lightweight carriage. And it goes so fast they started folding up their front wheels when they turn. Okay, what happened was Mr. Ackerman found out the problem was if you simply pivoted the axle, it didn't go through the turn right. And he developed this technology. And if you make a line through your lower ball joint or the kingpin pivot, doesn't matter, draw it to the center of the rear end. And very simply, if your uh, tie rod is on that line, if it's forward, if it's a front steer, it needs to be outboard of the ball joint, you see. If it's rear steer, it needs to be inside of the ball joint. That's really it. Now, Taking a suspension design for a 96-inch wheelbase, putting a 112-inch wheelbase, which we do every day with Mustang twos, does not have it perfect, but it's least close. The problem is when it's reversed. <coughs> and there are a lot of cars, even from the factory, in which it's reversed. 
Uh, but let's talk about this 40 Ford axle thing. I always like to start with axles. It makes it a little less complex than an independent. But when you take a spindle, 40 Ford spindle designed to do this, and put it on backwards, now what happens is instead of your wheels towing out in a turn, they tow in in a turn. When you think about it, your inside wheel has to turn a tighter radius, so you're developing some tow out, right? Okay. So now you got tow in. So one wheel's skidding all the time. Trouble is we don't know which wheel. Depending on what the traction is, one side of the wheel's wet, the other greasy part in the road, you know, you, you're just sliding the wheel all the time. And just as we said with those blurred tire treads from NASCAR, all this experimentation, you're losing traction. Now, you can take, and I've done this on a half a dozen cars locally for friends of mine. You can take that uh, 40 Ford spindle, now the tie rod's here, and just simply bend it out. You probably can't get it all the way, but get all you can. Because this is a case where close is better than not right. You know, you're less wrong is maybe another way to say it. And, and the evidence of that is there's a lot of factory cars, and you do see some people building Mustang twos for Model A's where they put them on backwards to make them rear steer, and that's another problem. Does it work? Yes, I've driven the cars. It works going up a straight, dry highway. Anything works fine going up a straight, dry highway. But when you start hitting the bumps and the hoop de doos you know, uh, it seems like the bridge builders and the highway builders must not talk to each other. You know, I don't know why it's so hard to get the highway and the bridge the same height. Now, maybe there's something going on I don't understand. I understand about frost heave and all this. And I've asked some buddies in the North Carolina DOT, giving them a hard time. I said, why can't you, don't you guys talk to each other? I mean, have lunch, figure it out, you know. But every bridge you come to, there's a hoop to do on each end of the bridge, right? And that's where my falcon wore out those tires. I live near the Susquehanna River up there. We don't call it a river unless it was a quarter mile wide, you know, pretty good sized rivers. And it would hit that. And it rains a lot up there. And if it was wet on one well, not the other, I mean, I almost lost that thing a couple times. I was 22. I might have been driving a little faster than I should have been. But you see the idea. You know, uh, one wheel's grabbing the pavement, the other isn't. Bad things happen. So these are practical examples of how you can fix these things. And if, if you've uh, noticed that when you back up, the wheel snatches. Or when you take a turn hard, make a U-turn um, if the tire wants to skip. That's when you start looking at Ackerman issues. Uh, I've made the point.